Well, hey, everybody. We're so glad you're here this weekend. I want to welcome all of our other locations, our Bluefield location. You guys are decorated like we are here in Abington, so it is beginning to look a lot like Christmas over at Wise. Uh, it's pretty neat. They meet at the Wise Inn, and they did all the decoration for them, so that was pretty cool over there. And then our Bristol campus, our Marion campus, so down at NCC at Johnson City, we're grateful for all that God's doing in all of our locations. This week, we meet with our regional pastor network that sort of extends from Blacksburg down to Jonesboro, so we're excited to meet with those guys. And our global partners are doing some amazing work all around the world, and we're so grateful for what God's doing. You know, they're celebrating Christmas, not only here in America, but Pastor Joel has the church decorated in Pakistan, so we think about Christmas. It's a world holiday, a world holiday. And it's all because of Jesus. So today we continue our Cup of Cheer series. And here's some good news. Uh, all of you today, all of our locations, every ministry that we have, every physical person today gets one of these cups of cheer. Now you might say, well, they didn't hand them to me. Where are they? They're under your seat. So on your way out, don't forget to take your cup of cheer with you. These are really neat cups. And here's the great news about it. What we want you to do with your cup of cheer, you're going to be so tempted to keep it, all right, because it's like a Yeti, and it's just crazy, and you're going to say, man, I've got to keep this. I've got to have one of these, but this is your invitation tool to a friend or a coworker or a neighbor. Now, if you're here today, and you're a first-time guest with us, then this is yours. You don't have to give it away. We just want you to keep it, but everybody else, if you keep it, and you drink something out of it, your lips will fall off. I just want to tell you that, okay? <laughs> so this is a, a, an, an invitation tool because during the Christmas season, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to invite a friend or a coworker or a family member or a neighbor to come to one of our Christmas services. So we have two more in the Cup of Cheer series. And then on Christmas Eve, Eve, as your campus pastor said, which is the 23rd, we have a special candlelight service, and it's going to be awesome. And I hope you'll come, and I hope you'll bring your family. Just be a special time where we can gather together. So what we're doing each week is I'm taking the cup of cheer, and I'm taking something out of the cup of cheer that I'm going to be teaching on that represents one of the four gifts that Jesus gives to us during the season of Advent. I'll explain to you a little bit about Advent just in case you were raised like me in a Baptist church. We never talked about Advent, so I want to uh, share that with you today because this is sort of our series that we're on a journey leading up to Jesus. So today, what reminds me more than anything else of the gift that I want to talk about, this is baby Jesus born in a manger, and I'm talking to you today about the gift of love. Now, there is no greater love than God sending his only son for us. He lived here 33 and a half years, right? And you know, the last part of his life, he was beaten and scourged and lied against and all these trumped up charges because he was declaring that he was the coming Messiah and the promised Messiah and Herod and all the like could not stand that. The religious leaders hated him and they decided we're going to eliminate Jesus. And so they thought they did, right? They nailed him to a cross and they crucified him. But on that third day, our Jesus, who was born as a baby in a manger, defeated death, hell, and the grave. And that becomes an awesome opportunity for us to experience the love that Jesus Christ has for us. So today, I want to talk to you about the second gift of Advent, we're going to look at all four of these gifts. You've seen them displayed in signage on your way into our campus. Last week, we talked about the gift of hope Jesus gives, that he gives us a new beginning. He gives us an inspired life. He gives us a future home in heaven. Today, we're talking about love, next week, joy, and then we finish up the Christmas cheer series with the gift of peace that we all desperately crave all around the world. Advent. These four gifts come to us during the four Sundays leading up to Christmas. Advent's all about the first coming of Jesus Christ when he came in a manger born in Bethlehem. And Advent is all about all of God's family looking forward to his second coming as king. One day, Jesus Christ is coming as king. 
So today I want to talk to you about this idea of love. Now, when we come to the Christmas season, there are certain things that we absolutely love about the Christmas season, right? I mean, we just can't get enough of it. And then there are other things that we could just leave, that we're not all that crazy about the Christmas season. So I thought just to bring a little humor into the message, we're going to play a little game and I need all of you to participate. Unlike the 930 service where four people participated. Okay. All of you, can I just see you by a show of hands? You'll play, you'll play along with me. All right, good. <clears throat> so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to name uh, some Christmas traditions and you tell, you just scream back to me, you love it or you could leave it. All right. Simple game. Here we go. Here's number one, putting up all the Christmas decorations and lights. Love it or leave it? Love it. Love it. All right. I think it's a few leave it. It's a couple of guys that leave it. So your wife's had you on the ladder probably. Here's one. Love it or leave it? Christmas sweets. Love it. Love it. I do too. How about this one? Last minute Christmas shopping. Love it or leave it? Leave it. Leave it. I'm, I love that one. I'm sort of a last minute Christmas shopper. Yeah. Here's one, family get-togethers. Love it or leave it? Love it. Love it. Uh, a couple more. Non-stop Christmas music. Love it or leave it? Leave it. Leave it. <laughs> one last one. Christmas movies. Love it or leave it? Love it. Love it. Awesome. Well, again, uh, there's so much to love about the Christmas season. And that's awesome because honestly, this idea of Christmas is all about love. Uh, Christmas is more than the decorations and more than the meals and the sweets and all those kinds of things. Uh, Christmas honestly is about Jesus, right? I mean, the love that God demonstrates to us during the season of Christmas. Uh, if you think about this world holiday of Christmas, without Jesus Christ all over the world, Christmas would cease to exist. I mean, uh, it would just be over. Uh, Jesus still is the reason we celebrate Christmas. Now, Paul describes it like this in Romans chapter five, verse eight. And I love this verse. This is what he says. He says, but God showed his great love. There's the word I'm talking about today for us by sending Christ. That's what Jesus did at Christmas to die for us. That's what happened at Easter. While we were still sinners, it's an interesting tagline Paul puts on this verse. So the real reason we celebrate Christmas is because God sent his son into the world to save us. Now, Jesus, he didn't come just to be a prophet, although he was, or to live a good life, although he didn't do good things for others. And he did those things too. That was not the reason Jesus came. Jesus came on a mission. He was destined on a mission. And John says that Jesus, the word, became flesh for a purpose. And that purpose was to reconcile a lost and broken world to God. That's us. We were lost and we were broken. So Jesus was born so that he could die for our sins. And that allows all of us to have the opportunity to be reconciled to God. Now, notice that Paul says here in Romans 5, 8, that Jesus Christ came into this earth to die for our sins, and we did not actually deserve that. Uh, honestly, the opposite. We deserved to pay the punishment for our sins, right? I mean, we chose to be sinful. That was our choice. We chose to go down a road that we knew God did not want us to go down. We chose to make decisions that we knew God would not honor. We chose to do things. You know why? Because we're sinners. We're all imperfect. We've all made mistakes. And while we were actually in rebellion against God, Jesus Christ came for us. So he came while we were still sinners. We didn't deserve his coming, but he came and he loved us and he offered us this ultimate expression of love. And because those of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ and we have experienced this love that Jesus gives, then it allows us to give his love to other people. Uh, again, notice here how John puts this in 1 John four nineteen. He says, we love each other because he first loved us. We love each other because he first loved us. So it's only because of God's love that we've been able to experience in our life that we know what real love is. 
And now we can show God's love to other people in our lives. Now, we're loved so we can love others. We're blessed so we can bless others. And he loves us and he wants us to show his love to others, especially during the season of Christmas. So today what I want to do is I want to give you four simple ways that we can love others, four simple words that we can demonstrate God's love to other people. Now, I'd love for you to write these down. We're going to give you something simple. And here's, here's uh, l- let me just share this with you. I learned a long time ago that the series that I would speak during the Christmas season because of all the other things we have going on in our life is pretty much going to be a simple series. Now, it's going to be biblical, straight out of God's Word, but I'm not going to do a dive deep through the book of Leviticus during the month of December, all right? Uh, I'm not going to try to teach you on the Trinity during the month of December because our minds are too occupied with all these other things we have going on. So today I want to give you just four simple things that I think if you can understand these four things, your Christmas and your family will enjoy so much more. Here's the first way we can show God's love. Number one, be kind, be kind. That's so simple, but so important, isn't it? Uh, There's an old saying that says, Christmas brings out the best in people. Well, I would say that's true sometimes, but honestly, that's not always true, is it? Sometimes Christmas can bring out the worst in people. Some of you sent me a few pictures and some of you sent me a few stories from your Black Friday shopping experience. And yeah, we saw some of the worst in people, right? I mean, they were crazy. The stress of all things Christmas can cause us to lose our kindness. And for some people, it seems like they just lose their mind. Kindness can easily be replaced by busyness and hurriedness and even nastiness, right? I mean, people can be nasty. And in those moments of frustration that all of us will encounter during this season, we have a choice to make. We can choose to be critical and join everybody else in the culture, or we can decide we're going to rise above it, demonstrate God's love, and actually be kind, be kind. That's why one of the best ways to show God's love is when everyone else around you is critical and you decide, I'm going to be kind. Now, it's not hard to be kind when people around you are telling you you're great and you're awesome and they love the gift that you've given them or they love being able to spend time with you and they're so encouraging. I mean, it's easy to be kind to people who are kind to us, right? But being kind when everybody else around you is being critical, that's tough. And there's a temptation for all of us to sort of join in on that bandwagon and just, you know, trash somebody along with them. Oh, you're right. You know, they are a jerk or whatever. So when you decide to be kind, when everyone else is around you, I don't know for you, but for me, that takes the supernatural power of God. And if we know Jesus, we know his love and those situations. Now we can still be kind when everybody else is critical. So where do you find that kind of power? Uh, Paul tells us in Titus chapter three, verses four and five, notice what he says. He says, when God, our savior revealed, here's these two words, his kindness and love. Paul puts these together. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. So Paul says the greatest example we've ever seen as human beings is the love that Jesus Christ gave to us because God through Jesus has given us the opportunity to be saved. And we don't deserve that. It's because of his mercy that Jesus has saved us. Now, what does mercy mean? Mercy means that God showed love and kindness to us when we really deserve punishment. Now, we really deserve the punishment for the sins that we committed. That was on us. And that's why when we experience Jesus and we understand we've been forgiven, that it ought to help us to be kind when others don't even deserve it. When we show kindness to others, when they don't deserve it, is one of the most powerful ways we can demonstrate God's love. You know, so when um, practically, when, when you're at Starbucks or whatever and Uh, There's only one peppermint mocha left in the machine and somebody pushes you out of the way and they get it and you don't, be kind. 
or when you're in that line with all your kids to get a picture with Santa, the perfect picture, and one of them's got to go to the bathroom, which never fails, and you leave and you lose your place, and 10 other families get in front of you, be kind. Just some audacious ways that we can be kind in this season. And when you do that, it makes a huge difference. So practically, uh, what are some ways we can do this? Notice how Paul teaches this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at verse 4 and 5. This is verses we normally hear at weddings. You may have heard these verses at your wedding. But it's real interesting. Paul wasn't in a wedding when he wrote 1 Corinthians 13. He was talking to the church. And he says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It's not proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable. So I look at that verse. I see three practical ways here that Paul says that we can share love. First thing he says is be patient. (laughs) During the Christmas season, patience is hard to find, isn't it? But if you turn that around and you become patient with your family and patient with your coworkers, that's showing God's love. Secondly, I think we can be thankful. He says, you know, love is not jealous. Now, for some of us, we got we to gotta understand this because most of us are born with a jealous spirit. And we see people who we think don't deserve to be blessed. And all of a sudden, they're blessed when we've tried to do everything right. And we're not as blessed. And they get the new house or they get the new car or they get to go on that vacation. Sometimes I'll have to admit, I've been a little jealous of all your Facebook posts. You guys are on some kind of crazy cruise or you're at Disney and I'm at St. Paul or something. (laughs) I'm thinking, you know, why? Yeah, I want to be with those guys. But I've had to learn when God blesses you, I'm going to rejoice with you. You know, I'm going to be happy for you. If you're able to get something here or you're able to go there, hey, you will always find people who have more than you have. And you can choose to compare yourself and be miserable, or you can be thankful for some reason God has allowed them this opportunity to be blessed and just be happy with them, you know? And that's where I think this scripture reads. And then finally, thoughtful, you know, be thoughtful. It says, love does not demand its own way. So when I look at that, this helps me to understand that this idea of God's love gives us many, many opportunities to be kind to others. And this is the idea behind the cup of cheer. We just give you this little tool that you can give a cup of cheer during the holiday season to be kind to somebody else. So that's the first way we can show love. This is what I want you to do at all of our locations. Play along with me here. Just turn to that person beside you and just say, be kind. All right, two of you did that. You can do it a little bit better. You say, I don't know this person. That's all the reason you need to be kind to them, all right? Be kind. Number two, be forgiving. Write that word down on your note. Be kind, number one. Be forgiving, number two. Now, we're going to step it up a little bit on this second gift because this is obviously harder than just being kind, right? The greatest gift that you can give your spouse and your children during the Christmas season is forgiveness because here's what we know. Our spouses are going to let us down. They're often going to hurt us. They're not going to complete us, right? Only Jesus can do that. Our kids are going to frustrate us. So we can choose to give the gift of forgiveness. Now, do we deserve to be forgiven? Well, no, we don't deserve to be forgiven. Do other people who have hurt us, do they deserve to be forgiven? Well, of course not. They don't deserve to be forgiven. But here's the truth on this. We offer forgiveness because Christ forgave us, right? Uh, Notice how Paul puts this here in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5. This is, again, what you hear at weddings. Love keeps no record of being wronged. Now, uh, let me just be transparent. When Brenda and I first got married, I kept a record of when she wronged me. You know, I'd keep that in my little book. And I know she had a book, too. And when I messed up again, she would often go back and not only be upset over how I'd wronged her that day, but she could bring, she had a lot better memory than I did. And she could bring all those other things that I had wronged her in. And we often do that, don't we? And finally, we had to learn that true love, just you're not going to keep a record of wrongs. If you really love somebody, you're going to forgive. 
Don't keep a record of wrongs against each other. That's enough. Some of y'all could go home right now and you'd be glad to be at church today. That's all, that's all you need to know. But learn how to be good at forgiving, especially during the Christmas season. Now, who is it that you need to forgive? Uh, it's very rare today that we would find somebody that just is at peace with everybody. Most of us have somebody, when I say that question, it comes to your mind. Again, the single greatest hallmark of love is forgiveness. Notice how Paul puts it to the Colossians in chapter three. He says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you should, is that what he says? No, so you must forgive others. So when you're in your Christmas gathering, you know, your work gathering, and all your coworkers are together and you see that one guy who's just been a jerk to you all year or to somebody else. They've been mean and cantankerous and you, you want to be, you want, you, everything in you wants to be a jerk back. But you rise above that and you decide, I'm going to be kind. That is a powerful demonstration of God's love. We choose to forgive even when others don't deserve it because we were forgiven when we didn't deserve it. So be kind, be forgiving. Turn to your neighbor, say, be forgiving, all right? Come on, I said, be forgiving. Number three, be generous. Be generous. As a child, I remember, and it's been a while, obviously, but I remember when I was a kid that the one single piece of mail that I could care about all year long, the rest of it I care less about, was the Sears and Roebuck catalog. All right, this dates me. But they had this Sears and Roebuck catalog, and they'd send it out over Christmas, and they had this huge toy section. And I would get that thing, and my mom and dad would say, okay, you know, you can use it. And I would start circling all these. I had something circled on every page, and then we would narrow it down. You know, I'd get two or three things, and that was the hardest thing. But for me, Christmas was all about getting something. You know, I mean, as a kid, it was all about, I'm going to get some presents. This is what I want. I hope mom and dad can deliver. You know, if not, it's going to be tough. But now, as an adult, I mean, the greatest thing to me about Christmas is seeing my kids open gifts. You know, when my nine-year-old gets that thing he's wanted and he opens it and man, he puts a smile on his face from corner to corner. That's awesome, you know? So as you mature... I mean, the real fun about Christmas is not getting something else. It's about giving, isn't it? I mean, most of us as adults, we don't need a whole lot more stuff. We've got a lot. Jesus said this in Acts 20, 35. He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And it's interesting when Jesus says this, he says a couple of blessings when you give. The person that you're giving a gift to gets blessed, but he says, hey, the giver actually gets blessed more than the person you're giving to. He says, you actually get more of a blessing. Now, why is that? Because generosity is an expression of God's love. It's more than just giving gifts to those we love. Rather, it's helping those that don't have what we have. It's blessing those who haven't been blessed in the manner that we've been blessed. And we share some of the excess that God's given us. Remember, we're blessed to be a blessing, right? Christmas... It's such an important time to show God's love by giving. That's why at Highlands a few weeks ago, we asked many of you to become a difference maker with us, to join God, to help serve thousands and thousands of people in our communities. And you guys responded in amazing ways. So this year, many of you have asked, when are you going to have the big Christmas production? Well, it costs thousands and thousands of dollars to do a Christmas production. And we had hungry kids every year in our communities that still had hunger after our production. And you know what we decided? We decided that we would take all those resources that we used to put in some kind of magnificent production at Christmas that would bring lots of people to see our performance or some kind of production and go into our communities and serve hungry kids and serve the elderly and serve people with addiction that needed help who were struggling. And we've served over 22,000 people since we launched this vision. And I can only believe that is so much better because of what you've done to help so many people in our area. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 42. And if you even give a cup of cold water to one of the least of these, my followers, 
you will surely be rewarded. So maybe this year, you could take your cup of cheer and you could put a $5 Starbucks card in it. That'd give them a half a cup of coffee, right? I mean, that stuff's expensive. Uh, they'd give them a full one at McDonald's. But you could give something in your cup of cheer just to be an encouragement to somebody else. It's a tool. So be kind, be forgiving, turn to your neighbor and say, be generous. You'll remember it a little bit more if you say that. One last thing. Number four, be open, be open, be open this time of year about sharing your faith with others. Because let me tell you where we are culturally. Uh, two weeks ago, there's an organization called Barna Research Group, and they have, they have huge reviews. I mean, their research is actually true. You can, uh, you can actually bank on it. And they did this whole survey over Virginia. It's taken them two years to do this. And this is what Barna Research concluded, and we got all this two weeks ago. It said that seven out of 10 people who call Virginia home have no relationship with Jesus Christ. Seven out of 10 Virginians have no relationship to Christ. You know, for me, and we sort of still have this idea that we're living in the Bible Belt, but you got to understand our culture is rapidly changing. Now, used to, the, pre, the premium invitation to a lost or person that had no faith was Easter. And people would come because they wanted to experience something of a religious experience. Today, it's Christmas. And this same research says that if you make an invite to a Christian service of faith during the Christmas season to those who are agnostic and atheist and the nuns and the duns and all these people, that they will actually come with you 82% of the time. Can you imagine? It is by far, hands down, Christmas is the season that people who have no faith whatsoever will actually come and experience a service where we talk about Jesus more than any other time of the year. Uh, notice how Jesus puts this if you're a follower of him. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. So in other words, don't ever hide your faith in Jesus. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Jesus said, as his children, those of us who have trusted and experienced his salvation, we are the light of the world. So we don't need to hide that. No, we don't need to be obnoxious about it by any means. But man, if you really believe in Jesus, you got to believe it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to you, that your sins have been forgiven. And you have a promise of heaven forever. This verse that I want to close with is a verse that all of us know. This may be your first time here, but I'll guarantee you know this because if you've ever watched a sporting event, you've seen it. John three sixteen. Let's look at this real quick. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to take that verse and I want you to make it personal. And I want you to take that word world and I want you to put your name in it, all right? Because this is really what Jesus did for you. So if you go back and you look at this, it says, I'll do it for me. For God so loved Alan that he gave his only son that if Alan believes in him, he will not perish, but he will have eternal life. Now I know most of you at all of our locations today, you've accepted Jesus Christ. You know that you have a home in heaven. But for some of you, you're just not sure. And for some of you, Today is your day. The Bible says today's a day of salvation. This is what the enemy says. Well, you got to get some things straight in your life. And when you clean up this and you do this and you get yourself presentable to God, then he'll save you. And this is what most theologians believe. Hell is going to be filled with people who are trying to get themselves good enough for God to accept because here's the deal. Jesus said you come as you are. And then he will help you by his Holy Spirit straighten all that other stuff out. <laughs> and those of us who know him know that's how it happens. So I just want 
to encourage you today. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, man, the greatest gift you could give to your family during the Christmas season is to become a believer and trust Christ for your salvation. Because that way, you don't ever have to be separated from your family again. You guys will be together for eternity. So would you pray with me at all of our locations today? Let's just have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you that you gave your only son for me. And Jesus went through beating and scourging. He went through a crucifixion on the cross for me. And God, that humbles us. But every person under my voice today, this is true for you. Jesus came for you. And you may not be aware of it, but you need a Savior. Because here's the deal. We've all made mistakes. And if we think we can forgive ourselves and pay for our mistakes, it doesn't happen. The only way to rid yourself of shame and guilt of the bad mistakes that all of us have made is through trusting in Jesus Christ. So I just want to pray a prayer with you. Maybe you're not sure you'd love to drive a stake in the ground. Just repeat this prayer after me. Just say, dear Jesus, I sure don't understand everything about it. But today, I know I need a Savior. And I believe in you today, Jesus. I trust you. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. And save me. I surrender my life to you today, Jesus. And if you prayed that prayer, the Bible says you're now part of God's family for all eternity. We'd love to come alongside you and give you a Bible and help you understand what decision you've made. Help you make that second step that's so important that you declare to the world that you're a follower of Jesus through baptism and then be a part of a local church. I thank you so much for our church, God. And today, our people, they love inviting their friends to a service. And I pray for every cup that folks take today, the thousands of cups that we're going to take out of our locations today, that you would anoint every cup. And God, you would lead us to the exact right person that will at least be receptive of an invitation. And that these folks might come by the hundreds, maybe even the thousands, and they'll at least hear the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is what Christmas is all about. Thank you, Father, for your love today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, before you leave... Uh, we have a little video that sort of gives you some practical steps on how you can use your cup of cheer with a friend. So watch this video and then our campus pastors will come and close us out. God bless you.